Hi everyone, uh, I'm Rafa Cohen and I run Product for Ways. Uh, I'm psyched uh, to be taking part in ProductCon this year. Um, still a bit stressful, I must say. Um, even though the circumstances are a bit particular to say the least, I'll uh, do my best to make this lecture insightful for you. All right, so frameworks rock. After engineering school, I discovered business frameworks uh, like Porter's uh, Five Forces and Hamrick and Fredrickson Strategy Diamond and I fell in love with them. So don't judge me for falling in love with something uh, so apparently boring. I realized that a good framework truly accelerates thinking and it could compensate for my laziness, lack of intelligence, shortage of creativity, uh, and more generally to avoid the psychological biases that plague our lives. Uh, so every morning my wife would ask me how I slept and the wheels would start spinning in my head. Okay, these are three main factors for sleep quality, time, comfort, number of wake ups. Uh, how did I do on each dimension? And of course, ultimately, I would just answer, great, thank you, how did you sleep, honey? But that's just because I had a basic framework for how not to make her hate me or something. So I don't mean to educate such an illustrious crowd about the value of setting good OKRs. Really, if your team doesn't take OKRs seriously, do something about it. Read the OKR Bible from John Dewar or whatever, and you'll see your life will get so much better. So having grown up not only in startups, but also at Intel and Google, which are like the Jerusalem and Rome of OKRs, uh, I even set OKRs for my personal life with high level objectives I deem as important, like be a healthy person, and measurable key results. Run 10K in 45 minutes, sitting rate at desk below 40%, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you can see here on the screen, that's a picture of my fridge showing only the non-embarrassing OKRs. So the beauty of OKRs is that they connect high-level holistic objectives with measurable and indisputable achievements. So unfortunately, OKR's usefulness depends on what you're using them for. They're fantastic for organizations, teams, individuals, but when I started my journey in the product management business, I quickly realized they lacked a few important characteristics uh, to be truly useful in products and in future development. So let's talk about some of the limitations of the OKR. First, OKRs don't really tell you how you connect your objective and your key results. So if, for instance, you have a laudable objective around developing, for instance, your relationship with your teenagers, um, you may set a key result of posting a certain amount of Instagram posts on a daily basis so you can impress your teenagers, for instance. Uh, you may even hit this goal, but it's not 100% sure that your objective will be reached. Okay, so that's one problem. Secondly, OKRs don't tell you anything about your ability to hit your OKRs. So I suspect, for instance, that good key result setting might not be useful to me if my objective was to win a gold medal at, uh, in athletics at the next uh, Olympic, Olympic Games, uh, for instance. Um, that's me eating hopes. So, and more importantly, OKRs don't tell you if your objectives actually matter. Why is it important to achieve this or that objective? So from my experience, the connection between objectives, key results, and your worldview in general is typically not very important for organizations and teams. So the objectives are usually more or less clear. So if you work for Intel, your objective will be to sell chips. If you work for Philip Morris, your objective will be some intentionally muddy version of selling more cigarettes, right? Uh, and you don't need much more in order to deliver good key results. The objectives are clear. So, Back to college. Coincidentally, because I had to take breaks from Fourier transforms and differential equations, I started to develop a very basic and, granted, shallow interest for philosophy. And of course, I would start summarizing the books I read into single slide frameworks, just because I could. Uh, I reckon that most 800 pages books from German philosophers could be better explained with less than four rectangles and, and five arrows. So you have Schopenhauer, life swings like a pendulum, backward and forward between pain and boredom. Um, Hegel conceives change as a progression of ideas following a known pattern, known as uh, dialectics. Uh, Marx and his materialistic conception of history and human societies, etc., etc. In general, those are very appealing frameworks, especially to a young mind. Um, they're not merely aimed at uh, analyzing case studies, but they offer a prism through which uh, one can make sense of anything in life, or at least that is the promise. Right? Uh, so according to philosophers, if something happened in your life and didn't fit the framework, you probably just misunderstood what, uh, what, what just happened. In the case of product development, having an hypothesis of what motivates people in a world where your product doesn't exist and how you would like the world to look like if your product was a hit, or in other words, a worldview, is something that I consider critical in setting the right goals for your product. 
you need a worldview, and OKRs can't help you with that. So one concrete and very quick example from Wix. Let's assume you have a business objective to have users to drive more with the app. This is a straightforward objective, and as a PM, of course, you need to get to work and deliver. So a bad PM will, of course, start from the future, like all bad PMs, and say, hey, let's put virtual goodies on road and have people make detours to win them. The more goodies you get, the more points you get, and the more points you get, the more points you have, or whatever, right? So let's make the game addictive also, uh, make it addictive enough so people drive more even they don't really need to. Um, and of course, the universe in which you're successful looks like this, chaos on roads. Uh, there's good news, by the way, you probably won't achieve your objective because nobody cares about your goodies on roads anyway. Now, if you're a good PM, you will set OKRs. You will set metrics, such as driven miles per user. You will start brainstorming with engineers, analysts, designer uh, about an idea which could move the needle in this KPI. Um, as an analytical person, you will probably um, quickly model driven miles per user as a function of sessions per user and miles per session. Recon that it doesn't make sense to have people drive if they don't have anywhere to go. Uh, so we'll decide to focus on miles per session. Um, you'll end up with some idea improving the end of drive experience, uh, probably around parking, um, to make sure the users don't close ways before they arrive at the, their, their destination. Um, because you're a data-driven person, you look at data, see that 50% of users in relevant audiences uh, don't complete their drive with ways open, and set as a goal to improve this by, I don't know, roughly half. Okay, um, you may be even uh, successful in your endeavor and get promoted. But if you're a product philosopher, you will have some informed worldview around the propensity people have to become extremely altruistic towards their own imagined group in the face of adversity, uh, and to develop maybe hatred towards strangers uh, when life gets tough. You will also think how miserable people feel every day when they commute in traffic, uh, you will dream of making their lives a little bit better because you believe that solving their problems is the only way to achieve your organization goals. You will connect these ideas, uh, build up some hypothesis that knowing what's on route reduces anxiety and stress and creates a delightful experience. Just one example. Um, you will bet that users in traffic will think of themselves as a tribe fighting against a common enemy, maybe a traffic monster, uh, and that they will take a high moral stance against line cutters uh, and other speeders by reporting what's on route, making other wazers life better and increasing the value they get from it, and then other user, uh, wazers will use ways more, et cetera, et cetera, creating a virtual circle. So we'll build uh, maybe a, a better UI. Uh, you will end up building a radically different, and I would argue better product that will ultimately build a world-class company because you can imagine how the world looks with and without your feature. So that's the difference between starting from the feature, starting from the objective, and starting from the worldview. So again, you need to have a worldview, but be careful. There is one serious pitfall to most worldviews. Making one's worldview evolve is not something that seems to be desirable for some reason. Philosophers in particular are stubborn creators. Much like politicians, their career would probably be over if they changed their minds. Uh, so it will often look like they try to bend reality to force it into their frameworks. So while product managers will need a worldview in order to build great products, we'll see how in a moment, they will also need to make sure it remains flexible and adaptive. This is why we have statistics, by the way, for uh, the science of changing your mind under uncertainty. Um, so still, it's risky, but there is simply no alternative to having a worldview. Every data practitioner knows that without data, you're just another person with an opinion, but everybody forgets that without an opinion, you're just another person with data. That's just as important. Before we talk about how to develop product in the context of a worldview, let's start simple and talk about uh, the other gaps in the OKR settings. First, assume you have the right objective. How do you set the right key results? So Google has a less known, just as internally widespread framework. Uh, used specifically for product development. It's called Goals, Signals, Metrics. I won't dig too deep, uh, but in a nutshell, goals and objectives are, are roughly the same thing, and they're still uh, the input to the framework, just like uh, OKRs. The output is a bit different, though. The goal of this framework is to use product managers and designers to find the right metrics for measuring success, not to uh, tag them with a the number, but to find out what's the right metrics. Unsurprisingly, there is a great framework for picking those two. It's called HOT, with a happiness, engagement, adoption, retention, and task success, uh, which I think is very useful because it forces PMs to think about both users and business goals. 
Uh, from my experience, most PMs have a propensity to naturally favor one or the other. Um, so this framework comes in uh, extremely handy in many situations. Uh, many situations, sorry. If you don't know about this framework, Google it or Bing it or whatever. There's plenty of material online. It's uh, highly recommended. What I think makes this framework so powerful, though, is the step between goals and metrics, the signal. Uh, this is a classic philosopher move. Think of the world in which your goal is achieved. What does it look like qualitatively? How do people behave? What's the impact on the universe? Uh, for instance, what other problems will it create? Are you happy with this outcome? After you do this, translating the qualitative goal into a metrics becomes a straightforward exercise. So goal signals metrics is a strong framework because A, it forces deep thinking for differentiating correlations and causations. We'll give an example in a moment. And B, it ensures you're building products aligned with your values. Once you have, right, uh, uh, the, you have the right metrics, you can move forward and set measurable goals, put tags on the KPIs. And here comes your second big pitfall. How can you estimate before you build something what is the impact uh, on your uh, metrics? By the way, why do we care so much about having success metrics? You probably already know this if you have some PM experience, but it's very easy to explain in hindsight why a launch uh, was, such, uh, was such a tremendous success. Uh, if it was your project or if you worked on it uh, and are subject to some cost fallacy, like, well, all units. Um, it's also just, by the way, uh, just as easy to explain why this very same launch was such a shameful failure if you uh, were against it to begin with because uh, you don't like the person who came up with the idea. Um, so in order to avoid this unpleasant situation, we discuss how success looks like before anyone falls in love with an idea. We never, ever rediscuss it later on. If a key result is not hit, the PM in charge of the feature must pledge to iterate and improve or to kill the feature. There is no middle ground. At ways, we try to come up with a framework that takes the best of both OKRs and goal signals metrics and improve it uh, uh, further and came up with Hoskar. Hoskar is the template for product philosophers and hence it became the literal templates of all of our specs. Uh, PMs must fill it in whenever they want to build something. They're free to discard anything that's not relevant to the problem they have in hand of, at hand, of course, but they can't keep thinking about it. So like any good framework, it forces thinking, right? Which is the goal. Hoskar stands for hypothesis, objective, signal, key results. With Hoskar, you don't start from an objective. You start from a worldview. So in the context of product development, this worldview is a qualitative growth model. So you're probably familiar with the concept of KPI trees. This is a framework that comes from operations. Uh, it serves as a taxonomy uh, of all the KPIs in a service or a team or organization, trying to understand the relationship between them. Uh, at first, they were aimed at aligning on the terminology to make communication easier uh, across different functions in organizations, but PMs and analysts started using them to uh, plan um, and to set their OKRs. So uh, in this example, for instance, in the classical KPI tree, uh, profit is broken down into two components, revenue and cost. Revenue is subsequently um, broken down into users and revenue per transaction, users into maybe retain and new, et cetera, et cetera, until each brand, uh, branch uh, ends at an indivisible KPI that someone in the organization owns, like conversion rate of signups uh, to your service or retention from week one to, to week two, et cetera, et cetera. That's a great start, but it's incomplete. First, uh, in modern businesses, network effects rule the world. So if you want to grow fast, you need to consider compounded effects of growth loops, which means that understanding whether KPI B moves when KPI A moves is not enough. You must take into account that if you know what you're doing, A will move B and B will move A, possibly through C or D or E or whatever. So in a straightforward example that everybody uh, knows by now, it takes a driver in some city for Uber to activate a rider there, for instance, but activating a rider will activate another driver with a certain probability. So it's a beautiful framework because in graph theory, you can very elegantly model nonlinear causal effects such as this one, because the more riders you have, the less likely you are to activate a driver when you acquire a new rider. So how many riders you have to begin with has a critical effect on the model. You can't do that with a KPI tree. So A, when you build a model of how the different actions of your product interact, build a graph, not a tree. The second problem with the KPI trees framework is that it tells us nothing about the force that makes KPI B move when KPI A moves, so take away B. 
think about those forces and be explicit about them when you build your growth model. This is how your actions or product actions are connected to the world and to the universe. So remember, this model, which is your worldview, this KPI graph, doesn't need to be perfect or to fully reflect reality. The more it is, the better your decision will be, of course. But PMs being in a business of decision making, there is no such thing as not making a decision. Not making a decision is a decision, right? So as opposed to generalist philosophers, product philosophers have to do everything to make their worldview evolve through constant experimentation and A-B testing uh, using the marvelous tool uh, that we call statistics. So this is an example of KPI graph we have at Waze. Every node in the graph is an action. Every edge is a value proposition. Values are values because of you know, the laws of physics, not because of your product or anything you're doing. So in short, the graph is your worldview. Maybe next year, if I'm invited again, I will talk more extensively about KPI graphs. Uh, in the meantime, our heads of analytics, which, uh, whom I uh, developed this KPI graphs framework with, uh, will publish a post on Medium so you can learn uh, more about it. So now you have a compounded growth model, KPI graph, or what I call a worldview, that changes every time you learn something new about the world and when you introduce something new into the world, like the ability for users to plan their next trip with ways on the web or whatever, for instance. You constantly run experiments to validate that those effects apply, to what extent, and to separate correlations from causal effects. Whether you're planning for a um, specific feature or not, at every point in time, your organization has analysts working on refining your compounding growth model, turning the qualitative model you have in mind, your worldview, into a quantitative one, understanding the relationship in, in, between those KPIs, and keeping your worldview up to date. So now you express an hypothesis on the relationship between some action and the value to the user or to the business. You are fully aware of the implication it has on the other user actions and how it impacts other KPIs because you have a model. Armed with this broad understanding and happy with the hypothetical universe you're about to create, you set your qualitative objective, just like in OKRs. Now you imagine a universe in which your hypothesis is validated and an alternate one maybe in which it's not. How do they differ? What happens in each one of them? Which metrics from your heart framework move and in what direction? Now your hypothesis is validated. KPI A moved by X percent. You feed this into your model, your graph converges to another equilibrium point that you like better. So now you're still happy, you still want to do this to develop this feature, move forward and don't stop until one of the following happens. Either the universe you wanted to create becomes a reality. Now you're happy, you strengthen your worldview, and you move on. Or you have updated your model and your understanding of reality and proudly killed the feature. Either way, the output of the process is an updated worldview. You learn something about the world and you made your worldview evolve. Let's do a quick exercise now and see how, the, um, how to use Hoskar in real life and see how critical this framework can become. So if you live in Israel, Mexico, Brazil, the US, you probably heard of Waze Carpool. Uh, in a nutshell, the idea of this service is to match people commuting in the same direction so they can share a ride, enjoy a better commute, save gas money, et cetera, et cetera. Even significant time in markets where driving restrictions such as uh, HIV lanes apply. Uh, as a company, our goal is to allow for society to end traffic without having to build more roads, uh, which as we know is a futile objective. Uh, uh, Lewis Mumford famously said uh, to explain the concept of induced demand that building more roads to prevent congestion is like a fat man loosening his belt to prevent obesity. Um, so making people, car, uh, people, people, making people leave their car at home uh, when they can enjoy the immediate satisfaction uh, and, and flexibility uh, and the illusion of freedom that comes with it is not an easy task, believe me. I have been trying for a few years now. Uh, I say illusion of freedom, by the way, because commutes typically don't look anything like those commercials where you see people driving fancy cars on the park ice of Antarctica or whatever. Um, so that, let's see how Oscar can uh, help us crack it. So start with regular OKRs. You're a PM on carpool, and you notice that 65% of rides in carpool happen between a rider and a driver who already carpooled together in the past. The next, what I call. Uh, as always, when I want to make a point, by the way, I'm making up numbers here. 
So like a good PM, you're data-driven, user-centric, so you decide to set uh, as an objective to make the experience flawless for historical pairs of couples. Being so fundamental to the overall experience, you define this flow as a critical user journey. Um, maybe you conduct some UX research to get insights on how people get to their past carpoolers, uh, how do they reach out to them, uh, what are the friction points, uh, how you can remove them, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So now you decide to build a new features, uh, favorites, um, maybe. So it allows users to bookmark their past drivers so they can easily find them and request rides from them. You look at your hot framework and recon your feature should impact retention maybe because it will be now easier to book rides with people you know on ways uh, than scheduling pickup uh, with text messages or on WhatsApp and being with, web, uh, with Venmo. Um, and maybe you also pick task success because doing so uh, uh, will become much easier. So you pick some KPI like share of rides with past carpoolers or number of rides with past carpoolers and set numeric goals for those KPIs. You do your job. Uh, you want to start building the feature, you review the spec with your uh, chief product officer, and you get sent to the host car and come back. And this is why. Then you do the same exercise with host car. With host car, you already have a worldview before you start thinking about your feature and before you looked at this particular data. And here it is. You understand that in couple, your currency is trust. Trust between people who don't know each other and quality of service, the liquidity in the network which allows you to rely on Carpool as a commute solution. Can you rely this, rely on Carpool as a day-to-day -day commute solution? So you talk to many users. In fact, you are yourself a heavy user. Uh, you use Carpool every day. You are data-inspired. And you know that the most critical friction point in Carpool is the, let's call it, the, extension, the existential anxiety people feel under uncertainty. Um, they send a right request. They have no idea whether the driver will accept the request or even if the driver is planning to drive at this particular time on this particular route. So worse, they could be experienced, they could experience the um, unbearable feeling of being ignored, like on the dating app. Uh, they like someone so much they want to share the most stressful time of the day with them and, and commute with them, and this person doesn't even care to reply. This is really stressful. So of course users will tend to request rides from people who they already met. Of course they will reply, uh, they know them, so of course they would ignore you, uh, and you can even guess when they will reply, in the evening, uh, a few minutes before the ride, etc., etc. So you understand and you realize this data, you observe, you observe this data because of your inability as a product manager to create a predictable experience for riders. It's not a goal, it's not a um, user need. This is um, something that reflects your own failure to create a good experience. So again, remember, this is the worldview you built in years of building features and running experiments for your product. It may not be accurate. Uh, in fact, it probably won't be because you know, life is hard. It does guarantee, though, to improve with time. Every time you launch something, you learn something, and your worldview evolves and improves. More importantly, it does guarantee that everything you do across the organization pushes in the same direction, in a cohesive manner. So it might not be the uh, right direction, but at least you won't have uh, different features pulling in different directions. So being a philosopher, you know what the data you looked at means. People tend to request rides from past calculators, not because this is the best experience one can imagine, but because it's a signal you're doing a poor job at building trust and predictability uh, in an interaction between strangers. So what you need is to address this uncertainty and alleviate this anxiety. So get started with, uh, with your host car. H. Your feature hypothesis goes as follows. By allowing drivers to pre-approve incoming ride requests in exchange for a small financial upside, we will create a superior experience for riders. What you're doing basically is you want to build, uh, I took as an example, Airbnb's instant booking, uh, if you've heard of, uh, but just for couple. O, your objectives. First objective is driver-centric. For the driver to fully utilize my car and save more money. Drivers are able to pre-approve riders willing to join their trip in exchange for increased payments of X dollars. Rider-centric objective. I can relax and book my commute. Riders are able to uh, instantly join the ride in exchange for increased payments of Y dollars. Business-centric objective. X is smaller than Y. That is, we can monetize this feature. Signal. In a world with such a feature, 
Many drivers won't be interested. They are here for the social experience and the money matters less to them. However, a fraction of our drivers are much more concerned with savings. They will try to maximize their uh, earnings and will fast market themselves as available before they start getting incoming requests. Earlier and earlier and earlier. Um, when such riders are, are available, maybe riders flock them in masses. They love this experience and they prefer instant book uh, rides uh, uh, compared to any other uh, offer they have on the list. When they're not, some of those very same riders won't even request a ride. They will churn from the service and they will take their car to work. Okay, so those are the signals that you're successful with these features. KR, you pick up your metrics, you translate your signals in measurable targets. Uh, so those will be mainly around happiness and adoption. Uh, you use your KPI graphs to set high impact targets for a small subset of rides and aim at increasing the subset in time because retention of those users is higher than average. Um, you expect those pre-approved rides to beat rides with past couplers every single time, all things being equal. Uh, and if your worldview is incorrect, you expect the share of couples between existing pairs to go up on the account of pre-approved rides between strangers. So I think that's something uh, very uh, interesting happened here. What you considered as a byproduct signaling failure in Hoscar, the propensity of users to prefer past calculators, that's a signal you failed, right? The OKR framework defined as an objective. So you have here uh, uh, the opposite goal that you're reaching with OKR or with uh, Hoscar. So in a typical fashion, starting from data and setting OKR for your feature, led to the opposite definition of success than starting from a worldview, an hypothesis, uh, and, and build your feature from there. So this is why context is so important when you build something, and why OKRs may be so dangerous uh, when they're misused. They might you know, even end up destroying your business, just as an example. You'll set as an objective something that is actually a signal of your uh, failure. So to conclude, I believe um, the difference between good and great uh, product managers lie in their ability to form a cohesive view of the interactions between the actions allowed by their product and the universe. So be a product philosopher, be an expert in statistics, in machine learning, in UX design, in finance, that goes without saying, but don't forget to learn about cognitive evolution, about sociology, about history, about anthropology, et cetera, et cetera. Build a worldview, build product that impacts it uh, positively. Uh, if the world surprises you and uh, the outcome is different than uh, what your model predicted, adjust your worldview and try again. Um, I will hopefully write a post about uh, Hoscar on Medium. Uh, follow me on LinkedIn, on Twitter if you're interested in learning more. Thanks for bearing with me and have a fruitful product come 2020. Thank you, everyone.